Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and today we're looking at a first submission here by Aaron of a horse, Memphis. Now, Memphis is a 10-year-old Holsteiner cross that is, uh, it sounds like he's been through the mill. She got him. He was in a hunter-jumper barn. He's been through many owners. Um, Aaron was able to find a new home for him after her trainer told her the horse was uh, not any good and was never going to get there. And then that person had the horse for a while and sent it back to her, and it came back worse than it was to begin with. So, here we are again. <laughs> Um, now, I basically believe that there are no untrainable horses. I've never met one yet, and I've been training horses for over 60 years, and uh, never found one that, that was sound, that wasn't trainable, uh, if one was willing to put the time into it. I mean, the biggest thing that people forget, this is a 10-year-old horse, so people think, oh, 10-year-olds, it should be doing this or that or the other thing. Well, the problem is, if a horse has never been trained correctly, it doesn't matter whether it's 10 or 20. You know, it's you're going to have to go back and start all over again, and it's going to take two years of work to put a foundation on the horse, maybe even a little longer. You see some of the ones that we rehab. I mean, they've just been so, you know, mentally fried and physically fried that we have to go very slow with them. But I, I've never seen a sound horse yet that wasn't able to come back and be trained. So just know that you know, as long as there's nothing physically wrong with the horse, that you should certainly be able to uh, to train him and not have any problem at all if you're willing to put the time in to do it. And that's the issue. You know, most people just want things too quickly. You know, they want to, they have an idea in their mind of the horse they want, and then they buy a green one and expect it to become that overnight. Well, as we know, it takes two years to put the foundation work on a horse. So, uh, one that's been going upside down all its life, uh, as you've experienced with this one, where he's just learned to fight. Like a lot of horses, and that's usually the ones that people give up on because they have just been fought with by so long that they just simply won't give it up. As long as you're trying to fight them into anything, they'll fight you to the death. And actually, most thoroughbred horses are like that, which is why they have such a bad reputation, you know, because they get these horses from the track into the hands of these beginners, you know, who don't understand how to handle hot horses. And of course, before long, they're getting hurt or getting the horse hurt or some such thing as that. So um, just know that there aren't no any horses that, uh, if they are sound, are not trainable. So if you're willing to take your time, I'm sure you can get there with this one. And of course, the place to start with that is is the lunge line where you're starting here. And of course, um, Aaron said that this one has gotten so bad that it just pins its ears back if you show it the saddle. Well, this horse was probably like so many hunter jumper horses, uh, probably jumped and ridden in an ill-fitting saddle that probably stabbed him in the shoulders every time he moved. And uh, you know, then he was probably beat through that when he didn't want to go. And you know, you do that long enough, and horses just eventually just tune out. They either go completely crazy or they just become so rigid that there's nothing you can do with them. And it sounds like this one has gotten to that point. But there is something you can do with them, which is just go back and start all over again, which is what you're going to hopefully do with this horse. Now walking here, we'd like to obviously see a, see a much more swinging and active walk. You can see how stiffly this horse steps behind. So this tells me the horse has never really been under itself its whole life. So I'm sure that this horse has never actually you know, taken two steps correct since, uh, or at least under saddle in, in its life. So we just have to back up and start all over again. So the lunge line is the first is where we start with that. You know, especially if we have a horse that, as you said, with this one has gotten so sour to even having a saddle on its back that that becomes difficult. But if you're willing to spend the time and get the horses uh, to, to come around and understand and trust again, so again that's the big thing with dressage. It's about trust. The horse has to learn to trust you. If you beat on a horse all the time, it's never going to trust you, and therefore it's never going to give up everything to you. You may be able to go win ribbons. <clears throat> in front of judges who who simply don't know what they're looking at and are willing to you know to score high hollow horses and tense horses which unfortunately we see every day in dressage but uh, if you're willing to take your time I'm sure you'll get there and I would love to see that happen I hate to see any good horse wasted so once again looking at this step you can see how the hind legs behind just step very very stiffly so we just want to try to encourage a little more forward as you can. Now, if you find with this horse, you know, a horse has been running around and bracing against bridles and various types of equipment, which you said this one has done this in the past, that they've tried all kinds of draw reins and shambones and, and the like. Now, a shambone is a good thing for this horse, but what, what I would suggest you do is just put the shambone on along with the side reins and just leave it really, really loose so it just doesn't do anything for a long time or for quite some time until the horse starts to stretch down. Then you can just gradually begin to take more contact with it. Because as I said, unfortunately, when horses have learned to fight the way it sounds this one has, um, it's going to take a while to just get its mental attitude back and once again get it trusting a rider again.
so it thinks it's okay to do the work that we do. But of course, that's what dressage is all about, is about teaching the horse to go in a manner that um, he feels comfortable. Simple as that. I mean, any other athlete, would you put an athlete in two small shoes and go tell him to run a marathon? No, you wouldn't. But people do similar things. They put a horse in an ill-fitting saddle and expect it to carry you around a, a, a jumping round or around a dressage test, you know, with points of the saddle, you know, stabbing into the horse's shoulders and these sort of things. So just know that it will take some time. But what I'm seeing here is certainly um, in the right direction, at least with the walk work there. He's starting to slow down. And you may have to just let the horse chill for a while, you know, and just don't try to do a whole lot at first. Just let the horse get relaxed. Um, a lot of times, not so much with warm bloods, but with thoroughbred horses get uh, aerobically fit very quickly. So if people pull them out and lunge them for hours and hours, the pretty soon it takes three or four hours. If you go down on the Florida circuit and you see what happens there and the you know, five o'clock in the morning, the grooms start lunging these horses on 40 foot lines and they just lunge them for hours and hours since they can't get away with the drugging anymore. I, I personally think the horses were probably better off being drugged in terms of their life, but uh, neither of those are really answers to the problem uh, of getting a horse trained. So now once again, looking at this stretch, this is starting to look really quite nice. Um, once again, we'd like him to swing a lot more. The hind leg is still very stiff and we see as he comes around the corner there how the the hind leg is still on the ground when it's way behind the body of the horse or when it's a foot or two behind the body of the horse. So it hasn't come forward. So it's not coming forward quick enough, which tells me that the horse is really hollow and it's, not, it's never really learned to step through in the gates. But what you're doing here, I believe, will lead to the right thing. As I said, what I would do if I were you is to put the shambone on as well with the side reins and just put it on loose so he can just feel a little bit and just gradually over many days begin to... Uh, get a little more, get a little, uh, tighten it just a little bit, but never so much that you're trying to hold the horse's head down with it. That's a lovely cat you have walking across the ring there. Obviously, he's not afraid of horses. And there you go, he starts to stretch a little more there. So what you want to try to do is, whenever the horse's head comes up, get a little more contact and push the hindquarters away from you. But there you go. Now, if you can get that much, that tells me you can eventually get the rest of it if you're just willing to take your time. Now, once again, even when he put his head down, he doesn't really start to swing much through. But that's just the first... Remember, getting the horse's head and neck to stretch down and get him to relax enough to just do that is just the first step. Then once we have that and the horse is relaxing and we have its, uh, its mind you know, into the work and not just resisting everything we're doing, then you begin, can begin to send the horse forward and through. Like that right there is starting to look really good. So every time it comes up, just like when you ride, you just want to correct it. So think of lunging as riding. You know, you rein, you have contact with the rein, and the whip is your leg. It's as simple as that. Now that's starting to look much better. Those moments when he's stretching are starting to look much better. It's starting to swing a little bit. Rhythm is improving a little bit there. Now once again, we can just still see how stiff the hind legs are, and that in, in time will improve. So you can imagine what happens to these horses, you know, when people try to jump in and ride dressage with their necks, they try to hold the head down. You know, what, what people ought to realize, the very first thing you should realize is if you need draw reins to ride a horse, you don't know how to ride. And I know there are a lot of people who will, who will take umbrage with, with me saying that, but that's the reality. You know, if you really know how to get a horse through from behind, draw reins are not anything that really have, you know, any purpose in your tack room. They're only used for one thing and one thing alone, and that is to pull the horse's head down. And especially when we put them between the legs, as you may have heard me say before, um, the person who uh, introduced the world, to, or at least the United States, to draw reins was Bert de Nemethy. And in his book, who was the great jumper coach, Hungarian uh, uh, jumper coach, who was the first person who taught all of those great riders like Bill Steinkraus and Michael Matz and those kind of people in the beginning, and George Morris. Even. Um, so they were fortunate enough to get an education from somebody who knew what they were doing. But unfortunately, as things, as the sport grew and splintered, you know, and, and then we got this situation where, you know, we used to have a coach who could pick the team, you know. And uh, the coach could even pick your horse and you and take you off the horse and put somebody else on it. But that, of course, doesn't happen anymore because uh, since uh, um, one rider back in the 70s or 80s, I think it was, sued the AHSA because she didn't get on the Olympic team and won. And so now the, the whole show world is playing right into the hands of these corporate people who put on these horse shows. In other words, it's simply whoever goes to the most horse show gets to go to the games and the World Cups and all these kind of things. So... 
you know, in the world today, I mean, if you don't have a million dollars to spend shipping your horse all over the place, you, you can forget about any of those kind of things, uh, you know, because it's not going to happen. Because there's too many people now who can afford that, who will just go out there, they don't care. They'll just have five horses and ship them around all over the world and fly them all over the place, you know, so they can rack up, rack up all these points. And that's really a sad thing, you know, because uh, unfortunately today we're seeing many people who are really not very good riders even making it on to our three-day event, uh, not three-day event teams, but our jumping team and our, um, dressage, especially our dressage team. Because of course dressage, unfortunately, right from the very beginning, and that's where it began to to uh, go in the wrong direction, you know, because dressage, we had a lot of people who dressage was appealing to because they weren't jumping. You know, uh, Mr. Oliveira used to say that um, if you're afraid to jump, you'll never really be a dressage rider because you'll never understand real impulsion. You'll be afraid of a horse that's really impulsed. Um, uh, Nuno himself was the, was the Portuguese jumping champion at 13 years old. They falsified his, uh, his birth certificates so he was supposed to be 16. So um, just to point out, you know, that, that, you know, dressage is the ultimate sport in, in, in uh, the ability to, uh, with horses, to communicate with the horse and get the horse finely tuned. And, uh, you know, if you're not doing that, unfortunately, the warm bloods today are also good that they've let a lot of people be trainers and riders who wouldn't have been if they had a lesser horse, you know. But the warm bloods now have been bred so much to jump. Um, there's a lot of them. I've had two or three of them that you couldn't even put in a ring or anything. They've even, I've even had some that have even jumped out of windows or stalls, you know. They just jump very naturally. So it's very different than, than trying to jump a thoroughbred that people had in the old days. But once again, this is starting to look better. He's starting to swing better. Look how the hind leg is getting a little more swing. It's getting a little more rhythm. So I think you're really on track here. And I think if you're willing to spend the time, I don't see any reason why you can't train this horse. I mean, it's a nice mover. And as it starts to stretch down, it's getting better all the time. So I'm not seeing anything here that bothers me at all. As I said, I would try the shambone thing just to, even though, but you are getting there in the side reins here. So I don't really have any big worries one way or another. So, But if you want to try the shambone, you can put that on along with the side reins. As I said, and just don't put it on very tight so it's just there and then we'll gradually, because um, it sounds like he had learned to resist um, by somebody putting on a shambone too tight. And then certainly you can ruin horses by putting shambones on too tight. And it's the only thing you can do with them that's that's really bad is you can put them on so tight. If you, you should never be trying to hold the horse's head down below the level of the withers. So that's kind of one of the rules with the shambone when you put it on. It should not be that tight. You shouldn't have to tighten it and pull the horse's head down to, you know, in order to, uh, to attach it. If you're doing it, it's probably too tight. And, the horse, and a horse like this is going to resist that. But once again, what a good rhythm you're starting to get into. I don't have any problem with this. I think this is really kind of a nice horse. I'd love to see you do something with it. And if you're willing to take the time. So I'm sure that what happened, because we saw some photographs of this horse before she sent it to the last person who had taken it. And the horse was starting to flesh out pretty nicely. And it came back just looking absolutely horrible, like skin and bones over its back. And actually looked like some damage had almost been done to it. Um, but that's the problem is, you know... Uh, so often that's what happens to this kind of horse is that they start, you know, people take them who really, oh, I want a horse, but they really have no, uh, nobody to help them do this correctly. And once again, that's part of the reason why we're doing this website thing and uh, having these videos available to people and why I insist that everybody be able to see everyone else's so we can develop a community of people who are all in the same mind and all trying to do the same things with our horses and getting them working well and, and people who really care about their horses. But how nice this stretch is starting to look here. When he's there, he looks really good. And yes, he pops up a little bit every now and then, but I wouldn't expect him not to. You know, once again, that's getting good. And when you get to that place right there, every time he gets there, then you just want to try to encourage him to just swing a little more actively. But compared to where we started, I mean, this horse, when we first started this session, had almost no flexion in his hocks at all. And now we're seeing a nice little bounce along there. We're seeing a softer kind of movement in his hips. Now, he still needs to get deeper underneath the body. But it, compared to where it was when we first started, when his hind legs almost looked like fence posts, there was almost no flexion in the hock at all. So remember, once again, that's what we're trying to do. We're simply, with the stretch, is simply allowing us to find the place that allows the horse's back to work. And look how relaxed and happy the horse is. And she said this horse is quite a bit like Balador, as we explained with him. He's the sweetest horse in the world till somebody tried to put a saddle on him. So his back had been so badly abused for so many years. I mean, he just, you know, was out of his mind. He goes, people just got on and fought with him. And I think probably the same result as this one. There are horses, when once they have been fought with for a long time, you know, they can exhaust just about anybody because they're willing to just stay there. And, you know, because to them... 
you know, you're literally trying to kill them in their mind, <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're training in that manner. They, it, it makes no sense to them. It's totally uncomfortable. They're forced into some horrible frame that must feel terrible for them. Wonder why, in, you know, and probably in many, many cases, an ill fitting saddle. So now you've got a saddle stabbing into them. You've got somebody holding them in a frame that makes it almost impossible to do the job that they're asking them to do. So you wonder why they become sour. You know, I think it's personally a testament to what wonderful personalities horses have that, you know, that more people aren't killed by them, that more of them just don't. And once in a while they do. I mean, I've retrained a few who had. Uh, who had just gotten to that point where they were would savage anybody who got near them because they had been abused so much. You know, the horse that I showed um, through Intermediaire and won my silver medal on horse uh, Dexter uh, was a horse who had come from one of the top barns in Europe, one of the very top barns and advocates of Rolker. And uh, when the woman got the horse, it must have been drugged when they bought it because they said the horse just sort of hung there, its tail hung between its legs. And of course, they got it back and found they had a grizzly bear. And the first time the lady tried to ride it, it grabbed her by the legs and tried to pull her off and stomp her on the ground. So, you know, that's a really sad place that any horse has gotten that, you know, hates human beings and hates being ridden so much. Um, that particular horse, the first time I took him to a dressage show, the first time he saw a dressage ring, he flipped over with me on him five times at the horse show, just o over and up, up and over every time you try to get him near a dressage ring. So there's a horse that had been pretty much destroyed. So with that one, what I did is I took him in the hunt field and I hunted him for a while and just got him moving and back to feeling good again and, uh, and of course, in a comfortable saddle. And I worked him just the way you're working this one. And uh, I went on to win a silver medal on the horse and throw him th th and show him through I won, and I ended up selling him back to the to his owner who gave him to me, who went on to be Priest and George of the horse of the year on the horse and uh, in her region. So um, I don't think there's many of them. Once again, I've never seen a horse yet that was sound that couldn't be trained if one was willing to take the time to do it. And even some with much worse conformation than this one. I mean, obviously this one has no muscle across its top line. And his back is a little sunken, but that's nothing compared to some of the ones that we have done this with and been able to bring them back and make them happy in the work. So once again, you know, I like everything that you're doing here, and I, I don't see any reason why, you know, there's nothing really going wrong. My only suggestion to you is maybe to add the sham bone along with the side reins, just loosely, so you can ultimately switch to the sham bone, because a horse like this is never really, you're still not getting, there's another foot of neck that you haven't gotten here yet that he still has to bring out. And, uh, and when you finally see it, you go, oh my God, I didn't, how did his neck look so long? You know, because he's still kind of scrunching himself up into the body as he moves. Even when he's stretching a little bit, he's not completely releasing yet. But he will if you keep on this track and keep doing what you're doing, I've no doubt. You know, and just taking your time here as you're doing here is also what you want to do. You know, just don't be in a big rush, you know. Um, and, you know, um, Aaron wrote to me and said she's working on her own fitness here. So, you know, take this time to do that because, you know, every rider has to realize that, you know, you're never going to be a better rider than you are fit. I mean, I myself, I'm 63 years old. You know, on my usual day is five or six hours of horses and then another hour in the gym uh, before I call it a day. And some days it's longer than that. So, you know, and I eat a diet of, of raw food to keep myself in shape and keep my energy level up. So there's a lot you can do. You know, that a lot of work for both of you to do. And uh, that's what every rider should think about that is, you know, you're not only getting yourself, you're not only working the horse, you're working yourself as well. Which means it's like when you go to the gym, you know, you want to engage all your muscles all the time. Like even when you're out there lunging this horse, you know, you want to think of it as like yoga and engage your core, you know, engage your abdominal muscles so you, you have strength. I can't tell you how many people... I have seen in my life just pulled right over by a horse on the lunge line because they start leaning over forward and and getting out of balance and then suddenly the horse throws its head to the outside and pulls them right off uh, right onto their faces. I've seen it numerous times. So once again, your posture is really important when you're just out there lunging a horse. So working on all that is also part of what being a real rider is. You know, dressage is a real the mentality of the dressage riders of the past was you know. Uh, this was something you devote your life to. It's a life work to learn how to do this. And it's not, you know, we used to think of, you know, dressage, they used to call it high school. Like when I was a kid, it was referred to as high school because it was considered, you know, only people with a certain level of education would move up into the high school. Uh, unfortunately, now that's all been dumbed down. I, I, I meet people now who have been riding dressage for years and have never even read a book about dressage by somebody any good. They've just listened to whatever the trainers are. You know, and uh, unfortunately, it's kind of the dressage world has gone the same way as the hunter world, you know. The the horses have been dumbed down. They've all taught them now to jump hollow and flat. 
here in the United States, you know, so that they can put a kid up on its uh, neck and have them lean over on the neck and go over a fence because there's no movement in the back. Well, what happens all the time is people go to Europe. I've seen it numerous times of uh, people that I've known about that have gone to Europe to buy horse jumping horses and ended up getting seriously hurt because they'd never been on a horse that moved its back when they jumped. So the first time they come over to a three or six foot, uh, three or four foot fence uh, and the horse goes over and actually uses its back, if you're up on the neck, you're going to go flying. And that's what often happens to them. And they, they don't even understand why. You know, they think it's a bad horse. But in, in fact, that's how a horse should move. You just shouldn't be riding by laying on the neck of the horse. That's a terrible place to be. No one should ever be taught that. But of course, it happened because, you know, the trainers found they could teach these kids to ride like this. You know, dumb it all down. The horses are hollow in the back. You know, they themselves ride the horses until they never stop. And if they dare stop once they get on them, they beat them up and beat them over the fences till they're sure they're going to go again. Then they put the kid back up, back in their little you know, position laying on the neck and around they go till the horse gets sick of it again. But unfortunately with that, you know, so many of the horses end up figuring it out and uh, pretty soon they're the ones that like this one. Oh, he can't do anything with them. Well, I think you can do something with them. So I would contradict your, your trainer, whoever was working with you on this. I think this is actually a pretty nice moving horse that if you're willing to put the time, if the horse can do what it's doing right now, that is, trot around a circle sound. He's not particularly excited and relaxed. There's no reason why, if you're willing to spend the time, you can't get all the way there with the horse. I feel quite sure that you can. And, you know, in what you're doing, your, your lunging technique is really quite good. You know, you're keeping the horse um, out away from you on a nice big circle. It's moving quite actively. And once again, as the horse relaxes, then start to encourage a little more to swing through. But don't be in a hurry to even do that. You know, when you have a horse like this that's been so checked out about riding, you know, you really just have to go back and just appeal to its good nature once again and just get the horse back in the idea of, uh, you know, that this isn't going to be a misery for him, in other words. And what you're doing here isn't. Really nice there when he starts to stretch into that. And I like how you're staying away from the canter because I have a feeling I'm just seeing this horse move. I have a feeling his canter would be quite hollow. So um, once again, I think you're doing the right thing not to do much of that. I wouldn't even think about cantering this horse until I got him really stretching in the walk and trot completely. But you're getting there. I mean, look at this. This is absolutely lovely. So what's wrong with that? All you have to do now, it still needs to be a little bit longer and a little deeper. He can still go. But notice how every time he gets that little bit deeper, how much rounder the hawk action is. So that's really good. This is one I really look forward to seeing over time because I think it can really turn into a nice horse. Right there, quite rhythmic, quite swinging. Has a nice little bounce to the trot, too. That is a little bit of suspension. And the more he relaxes, the more so it is. Once again, remember, where the head and neck is positioned has almost nothing to do with whether a horse is on a forehand or not. Always remembering that a horse that's hollow, no matter how high it lifts its knees, it's still on the forehand. Lifting the knees is not, does not mean the horse is not on the forehand. Lifting the entire body up. When you see a correctly developed horse in collection, the entire forehand is lifted up. The body of the horse is lifted up. The gates aren't that exaggerated. Go back and look at some of the great riders of the past. Um, somebody like Reiner Klimke or um, Klaus Bockenhall. Uh, watch the horse Rusty. Uh, from Germany, you know, look at some of the people from the past and see how they rode their horses. I mean, I can remember I was fortunate enough to go to the Los Angeles Olympic Games and seeing Reiner Klimke warm up, and that was the first time, that was the highest score in history when he broke all the records. And it was beautiful to watch. He warmed up, stretching his horse. He'd do a few stretches, do a few things, bring him back up, do one or two movements, put him back. Now, everybody else in the ring, it was such a, such a, it's so interesting to watch that warm-up ring because everybody else was in the ring grinding their horses through movements. Most of the horses looked tense and irritable or completely hollow. And, uh, and here's Reiner. He's just like stretching, bringing the horse back up, does a couple of movements, you know, and, uh, and then goes in and gets the highest score in history at that time. And, you know... If you went back and looked at some of these tests from the past, I mean, there's no way, of course, that some, any of these contemporary... When I see horses uh, like this totalist, even completely lame, 
and hollow and he's being given you know after his sale and being given an 81% you know he should have been he shouldn't have even been allowed in the ring he was that lame had i been the judge but of course unfortunately dressage has just gone down this road where you know it's just run run for the sake of a handful of people and uh, you know we've we've abandoned the horse and that's my objection to it that's why i tell people all the time that we should be talking about this and people should be writing to the USDF and the FBI and demanding, you know, basically that they reform dressage judging, you know, and bring the sport back before it's completely lost. Because, for instance, at the Olympic Games, I mean, what a joke that somebody could buy a horse six months and have it for six months and think they could go to the Olympic Games and get a, get a gold medal or even ride at the Olympic Games. That shouldn't even be allowed. You know, you should have had to own a horse for at minimum of two years, if not four years. I would make it four years myself, and I would make a rule that most of the training had to be done by yourself. Because that's what dressage means. It means training. So you're actually, what you're doing here, you're doing more dressage than most of the people you see on their fancy upside down hollow horses because you're actually doing dressage. You're doing some good for the horse. And that's what dressage is. It's about doing the best thing for the horse and training in a way that it can become a companion and a partner in this work. Because, you know, this is dangerous work. You know, In my life, I've, I've been doing this for so many years and in so many you know aspects of the sport, including fox hunting, uh, I've ridden open jumpers, um, I've ridden three-day eventing, as well as dressage, and, and I, even when I was a kid I showed western and all kinds of things like that, you know, and uh, we've just, we just, we need to get back to having fun with horses again, instead of it just being this thing about putting ribbons on the wall. And look how nicely this horse is starting to swing, and that's why I talk about training, so the word dressage means training, it means training the horse but in the best possible way, that is, a way that develops the horse, that we develop it physically through gymnastic exercises. We develop its physical and mental attitudes. That's what dressage is in a nutshell. So if we're not doing that, in other words, if whatever you're doing doesn't have the best interests of, in, of the horse at heart, you're really not doing dressage. I mean, really, people should go back. I mean, this goes all the way back to Xenophon the Greek, you know, who quoted Simon the Greek, whose writings had been lost, as, as his master who had taught him these things. You know, so what I'm telling you, and all of the things, you know, people will, will write to me and say, oh, your method, none of these are my method. I, I maybe have figured out a way of explaining it to, the modern, <laughs> to modern people a little bit, but none of this is my method. All of these methods that I am teaching you are, are tried and true. That's why if you read the books that I give you uh, on my website, you'll see that they all are basically on the, same, uh, on the same page about how this is done, and these books are by some of the best people that have ever lived. So, and they all agree. So once again, remember, you know, even only as far back as World War II as was the big change, you know, when suddenly, you know, people before World War II still went places on horseback regularly. Not everybody had a car in their garage, you know, so they were still used and had to ride from one town to the other. As my father used to say when he saw a hollow horse, he'd always say, oh, you'd never make it to the next town on that. And, uh, you know, he started saying that to me when I was four years old, or even younger, I suppose, before I can even remember. But look how nice and swinging this is becoming. You would make it to the next town riding like that. You can imagine if you started off in, you know, with the horse, as you said, like fighting your way, and you had to ride 20 miles. But if you get the horse into a nice trot the way you just had, you could easily ride it for that far and further. So I think you're right on track here. I'm liking everything that I'm seeing. As I said, as he starts to relax a little bit more, you can start to push him through a little more. But we got to a wonderful place in this. My only suggestion is to maybe put the shambone on along with the side reins, just loose so he gets used to it. So ultimately, he'll begin to stretch down once he starts the idea of fighting, because it sounds like somebody got him fighting in a shambone. So we don't want that. So we want to use the long side reins along with it. But once again, we're not forcing the horse into any kind of frame. None of these things are going to be so tight that they're going to force the horse to do anything. And you're just going to send him through. And in time, I think you've already made huge progress. And I think you can, uh, you can really get all the way there with this horse. I don't see any reason why not. Believe me, I've taken many that looked a lot worse than this one <laughs> and brought them back. So great job here. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing your next horse as well. Erin has another one that she sent that we'll see soon. Um, but great job here, right on track. I couldn't be happier with what I see. Keep up the good work. It's Will Faber from Art to Ride.